discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited by the program that we have and with the participants, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, Shelley uh, Chatter from the World Health Organization who will start. Also Mark Laurens uh, from the Make Listening Safe Work Group, Marcel Koch and uh, Jakob Naune van Fleet. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing your, your lectures and, and having the discussions. Um, and I think I will start uh, right away. Um, I'm also I have the Q&A chat open and will try to to pick up uh, any questions that may come. Uh, and if I'm suddenly unaware of anything, then I hope somebody will help me, either Shelley or, or someone from the audience that will raise it. So please, um, Shelley, uh, chat there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dorte. And uh, thank you to Danish Cluster for this opportunity to speak to everybody through this forum. So let me start by um, sharing my screen. And today I want to give you a quick introduction to, to the Make Listening Safe. So what is this initiative and why is WHO working on it? So you may be perhaps be surprised to know, and perhaps not, uh, that hearing loss is very, very common. Currently, one out of every five people, that is nearly 20% of the population, has some degree of hearing impairment, some degree of hearing loss. And what is projected or what is predicted is that the, this trend, the upward trend in uh, hearing loss is going to continue. And it is anticipated that by the year 2050, nearly 25% of the population would have some degree of hearing loss. And while demographic trends and you know, demographic changes in the world's population, they are contributing to this because well, we, have, uh, we are living longer and uh, so we have uh, more people who are older, which is, also, which is contributing to this. But it is also a fact that persistent and increasing risk factors play a huge role in this rise. For example, over a billion young people are at risk of hearing loss simply because of the way they hear their music. That's about 50% of the young uh, population currently. So 50% of them are at risk of hearing loss because of the way they're listening to music. So realizing this, in 2015, WHO launched the Make Listening Safe initiative, the purpose of which is to ensure that people of all ages, they should be able to enjoy listening to whatever it is that they want to listen to, whatever content they wish to listen to, but without putting their hearing at risk so that they can hear now and enjoy their uh, music and the wonderful sounds today, but also after 40 or 50 years. In order to do so, the Make Listening Safe initiative, it adopts the approach that of changing listening behaviors amongst the target group. Now that's a tough call, that that's a tough um, a goal to strive for, to change listening behavior that do amongst young people. So how we approach it is in a, in a, I would say, biphasic manner or a dual approach that on one hand, we have to inform and educate people about the risk of unsafe listening, about the risk of loud sounds, about uh, the way that they can listen or, or now and, and across their life course. But at the same time, simply informing and educating people is not enough. We need to provide suitable products, suitable regulations, create that environment, have those tools available to them where, which can enable them, which can support them to, to practice safe listening and thereby reduce their risk of hearing loss. So that is the kind of philosophy on which this initiative is based. So what is it that we do in this initiative? So we work on four things mainly. So one is awareness and advocacy, which as I mentioned is, uh, is one of our key areas of focus, uh, but also research, both primary research in certain cases and, and a lot of secondary research because 
uh, all the recommendations that we make and products that we develop must be based on evidence which already exists or, or is generated. Um, then also looking at reducing the risk specifically from the use of uh, personal audio devices like listening to music over headphones or earphones through your smartphone or MP3 players. Uh, and for that, WHO has the global standard for safe listening systems. I, I'll come to that in a moment. And also looking specifically at how to reduce the risk in entertainment venues and in events. So that is also something we are working on and I'll come to it in a minute. So for, um, for communication, for, for raising awareness, we focus a lot on communication, on developing materials, which of course WHO pushes out on its own, but we also rely a lot on, the, uh, on our partners, stakeholders in this field, on the Make Listening Safe Working Group that Mark will talk to you about in order to amplify and disseminate these uh, messages, these materials and, and tools. So materials uh, such as, you know, flyers in different languages, also little videos and gifts and so on. So let me go on. Um, we are also currently focused on developing different tools for uh, raising awareness, which target um, governments. So how can governments work, uh, raise awareness on this or educate um, their populations of their countries about safe listening? So we are developing this. This will be launched in March along with a toolkit for journalists. So how can the media communicate about uh, hearing loss and about safe listening. So giving them in one place, all of the facts, figures, the information that they need to write a, a reasonable article and a fact-based article on, on safe listening. Um, then also we will be working in the coming two years on developing a module for children, school children, and on a pledge for music makers. Uh, I mentioned the global standard for safe listening personal audio system. So this we developed in collaboration with the Information Technology um, Union, the ITU, which is a UN body, uh, which looks at standardization. And we worked with them, other stakeholders and private sector to put together this, uh, this set of recommendations. So what this standard, as it is called, recommends is really, I, I like to put it in three blocks. So one is that every device which is used for playing music should be able to monitor and display what is the volume level at which the individual has, is listening or has listened, what is the time they have spent on listening on their device, and how much have they used their sound allowance based on an 80 decibels, uh, 40 hours cutoff, how have they used their sound allowance? 40 hours per week cut off. So 80 decibels per 40 hours a week, that is the sound allowance. So, so it gives it as a, um, whether they are good in that or not. So they should be able to monitor, but also make this information available and accessible to the user so that we don't just tell them, oh, listen, um, turn the volume down, but they know exactly what it means to turn the volume down for themselves. Um, so it should be able to offer volume limiting options such as an automatic volume reduction or a password, uh, password uh, protected volume control and should be able to actively inform the user in the form of sending some alerts and notifications or uh, messages or warnings saying, okay, last week you listened too much or last week you did well, continue like this or uh, make some changes, et cetera. So give that kind of information. So this has been developed and, and is available. It has also been implemented uh, by some uh, of the leading uh, manufacturers. So you're welcome also to take a look at how it is. And it's something, it's a work which is, even though it has already been published, we are working now on the second version. So you're welcome also to provide your inputs uh, if you wish. We are also now working at, uh, or rather we have already developed a conformance testing mechanism so that uh, those devices which, which conform with this, which 
are uh, compliant with this, uh, they could, if they wish, they could apply, they could get their devices tested and have a certificate of uh, compliance so that they can claim to be um, implementing the WHO ITU safe listing standard. So, so that is something which in, in compliant products would then be identified with the help of a QR code. So that is also work which is ongoing. And as I mentioned earlier, we are developing the standard for a safe listening entertainment venues, which looks at the sound level in venues, but <clears throat> also looks at the monitoring of these levels on the venue acoustics and sound system design. Uh, and thank you very much, Dorte, Mark, Marcel, uh, all of you for your inputs into this, uh, this document. It also looks at provision of uh, hearing protection uh, for creating uh, some quiet areas, audition respite areas, as well as providing information in these venues. So this is uh, something we expect in March 22. Um, and uh, I invite all of you, we had an information session on this uh, a couple of weeks back, but uh, if, if there are thoughts that you have, you're also welcome to um, to write to us, to share more information, or to, you know, give some feedback uh, on this. So uh, in the end, I just want to say that this is a collaborative initiative, which, and we have a large number of stakeholders uh, from all sections of uh, relevant sections of society who contribute to it, and to have, the, and it also forms part of the work that we do through the World Hearing Forum, which is a global alliance with that uh, for um, action on hearing loss. And I will hand back to Dorte and you will hear more about the work that the forum is doing from Mark. So thank you, Dorte, uh, for this and back to you. Thank you, Celia. So we have a couple of minutes if anyone uh, have a question. I don't see any open questions in in the meeting chat um, and we can also uh, return uh, to this discussion after Marx. Um, I, I have uh, perhaps one because uh, if, if somebody wants to participate and contribute, you know, with best practice examples or be more directly involved in the work, uh, what would you suggest, Shelley? Should they just contact you or what is the procedure? Yeah, absolutely. So they can certainly contact uh, me directly. Thank you. And I did have a question in the regular chat from, from Jeremy Maroso. How can the level be monitored if we don't know which headphone is used? Um, yeah, that's a good question, Jeremy. One of the challenges that uh, has been addressed uh, in various ways. Yeah. Um, and um, I think the answer is you cannot really. Um... Yeah. So the system does monitor according to the, um, so for example, an Apple, uh, let me take the example of an Apple system. It would usually be able to monitor if you're using it with uh, its calibrated headset, that is with an Apple headset. Uh, it is also programmed with other uh, possible um headsets but then given the range there is and if there is if for example you plug in uh, a headset which is not um not calibrated with it it will not give you the results so you would not have that reading on your device if you're using a headset that was not already pre-calibrated for this assessment yes thank you Okay, um, I think we will move on uh, to Mark's uh, presentation. Uh, Mark is the co-chairman of the Make Listening Safe uh, work group and uh, the president also of the European Acoust Association of Hearing Aid Professionals. He works as a lecturer at Tom and Moore University um, and uh, medical scientific research man manager at Amplifon in Milan. Uh, so please, Mark. Maybe it's wise to unmute, otherwise it's difficult to be heard. <clears throat> I will make listening very safe, but it will be very difficult to understand me, so that's an issue. Thank you for the kind introduction. I suggest we move right away into the topic. So um, when we... Okay. 
when we talk about the different work groups we have and the different expert groups we have at WHO in, in the department that Jelly was talking about, on the one hand, we have the Make Listening Safe technical group. And they're the group of experts that prepare material. By the way, also Dorte is part of that group, developing new ideas, joining forces, creating content, uh, preparing uh, standards and stuff like this. And they are really the content group preparing everything on an evidence-based way. Next to that, we have the Make Listening Safe work group, uh, which is part of the World Hearing Forum. And they are more the communication part of this. So I think the Make Listening Safe work group is ensuring that we communicate, that we promote, that we uh, contact uh, uh, different stakeholders into this and make sure that this is happening. And you will see there's a lot of activities we need to develop to make sure that those smart ideas that come from the technical group are implemented and is known in the public. And then the third one we have is the Make Listening Safe LinkedIn group. We have seen that has been very uh, effective into joining, having more people join us and more people know us. So I will share the link uh, after this, uh, this talk. But it allows us to have controlled information because it's a closed group and we have to validate all the information that is published in that group. We can exchange with experts and a lot of them are part of the LinkedIn group. We can recruit more people for the World Hearing Forum. We can widen the Make Listening Safe expert group and we also can find experts in different target groups. And that's quite helpful in this, uh, in this uh, tool and in this platform. Now, what are the current ITU safe listening standards and WHO safe listening standards? So you could, it could be somewhat of confusing because we have on the one hand the ITU H.870 safe listening devices and system standards. And then you also have what you call the WHO version of that standard. In fact, it's identical content. I must admit that the WHO version is more uh, user-friendly and has better pictures and graphs, but the content is exactly the same. So I think they were launched at a different moment. Afterwards, there was a next kind of a partner standard being launched, and that is the H.871. And that has, is related to personal amplifiers, personal sound amplifiers. And then the fourth document that has been created, Shelley talked about it, is the conformance test document that stipulates how you can test if a safe listening device complies to the standard. Now, what is the logic of all of these and what do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is that they kind of drift away from earlier ways of making listening safe. Because originally, we all thought that you had to limit the maximum output and that the maximum level coming out of a device or a headphone had to be under a certain level. That's a bit what we will see sometimes in the safe listening venues <laughs> guidelines at some point. But you need to be careful because if you do that, you typically get what they call the war on compression. Then typically, these systems start to compress the sound so they're all compressed, so they are under the maximum level, but at a constant, fairly loud level, and that doesn't really help you that much. So what is happening is that they calculate here, those devices calculate an average exposure over time, and it does this on a weekly base. And the logic is what you find here. So Shelley was talking about that we had to limit it to 80 dBA for 40 hours. And we use what they call the energy equivalence principle. So every time you double the energy, that's increasing by only 3 dB, then you cut the time of exposure you're allowed to have by in two. So that means 83 means 20 hours, 86 is 10 hours. There's also a second level that is initiated for sensitive users and for children. And there we use a much safer approach where in fact the exposure dose should be 75 dBA for 40 hours with the same logic. Does this energy equivalence principle work? Well, typically it does. I think we have also seen experiments from Kawamori from Boston, looking at animal experiments, seeing what kind of energy does create cochlear damage. And it seems to follow this principle quite, quite well. So it seems to work quite well. We have to admit that all the evidence we have typically comes from industry exposure. That is why you find most of the standards. And some claim that music is more friendly than noise and that our cochlea should be less disturbed by music signals and than by a noise signal. But the evidence there is quite weak and it doesn't seem that our hair cells care too much if it's too loud. It seems to be too loud and it's creating damage. Now it's not only, as you have heard from Shelley about 
setting a level or measuring what you are doing, I think we need to do more because if you want to change behavior, it's not enough to test something. So on the one hand, of course, you want to inform the user about the weekly dose. Am I now at my weekly dose? Am I under it? What can I do? But also what is safe listening? How to use safe listening features? So here you see uh, examples of displays you can use. I must admit that uh, comma something is not used that frequently. I think that typically we give different numbers to show where you are in your weekly dose. But also here, other information about safe listening. Why should you listen safe? And safe listening is not about spoiling the fun. Safe listening is making sure you can enjoy the sound and you can enjoy the music for the rest of your life. There's no reason to lose your hearing if you do things safe. Now, a special standard is the H.871, because that is a standard for personal sound amplifiers. And there we distinguish between the PSAPs, you may know, the personal sound amplification products, but also the PSAAs, that are personal sound amplifier apps. And they are getting more and more used today. I think these are kind of these ugly looking hearing aids that are sold by on, on, on television commercials from time to time. These seem to get much more uh, move right now. And it's fine that these personal sound amplifiers are used as long as they are safe. And that is why this standard is here. And the first one is easy. If, the, if you have a smart personal sound amplifier and typically those apps can apply it small, you can use exactly the same logic as you will find in the other make listening safe standard H.870. So your weekly dose has to be less than 1.6 Pascal square hours, which is a complicated way to say the 80 dB exposure for 40 hours at that moment. But we also have personal sound amplifier products that are not that smart and don't have the capacity to measure weekly dose. And then you have to use the old fashioned way of restricting them in output. The logic you will find in this standard is they have to be permanently limited to a max output of 95 dBA. And the logic is that since you have a crest factor, a dynamic range for speech that is at least 12 to 70 dBA, then typically people will keep it under 80 dBA exposure because it won't sound right. And I think you will have poor crappy sound quality, so it will automatically drop. And here again, it's not enough to just limit the sound level and the dose. You also need to provide good information and adequate warnings. That's what you need to do as well. And then our compliance document that has been released, in fact, uh, since already April, it, it's ready. So what it does, it gives you a table of the different aspects that you can find back in the H.870, and it also refers to where you can find that clause, then it needs to be tested, and then you can see if it complies, yes or no. And we have mandatory, we have recommended, and we have optional uh, aspects in there, and then a confirming testing lab can check that. And if that is correct, you can say that your product does comply, and it will be on the ITU website, you can have a QR code, and you can mention that to inform users that this is a safe listening device, which is probably good and makes it uh, positive to work for, for it right now. Uh, so more and more products are being uh, are implementing this standard and now this compliance we have to promote. I think it's a very good way to make it an attractive tool for manufacturers and products. But what about the future? We heard from Shelley that we're already working on the next version, the next uh, version of the H.870. And one of the new things is there also, which is in there is to include smart headphones. Because today you have smart headphones that in fact can already calculate weekly dose on their own. So they have the capacity to calculate this. And since you may use your smartphone, uh, as a smart headphone quite frequently, that's also a smart way to implement this information. And they have ways of communicating. Also, they can display the weekly dose typically on the smart device to which they are connected. So that is possible. Another new standard we are right, working on right now and starting to develop is a safe listening standard for gaming and esports. And there I would kindly invite all of you, if you know somebody or if you have expertise in this domain, please let us know, please contact us because we want to use all the expertise available. We have learned that there are many esports where the sound level is very important. And a lot of those esport players, they put the sound level very, very high. So they will be the first one to hear a certain signal and they will be the first one to do something. I was nearly going to say to shoot, but it's mostly shooting that they will do at some point if they hear where the sound is coming from. And if you set it loud, then you will be able to play better. 
But of course, what is then the risk for your hearing? So there is a lot of discussion going on how you can make these safe. And I'm sure it's definitely possible just looking into this. Another level we want to look into in the short, short future is car audio safe listening. So the inside the car, the sound systems who are there, of course, it's different because you don't use a headphone at that moment. It's a different way of connecting and calculating and evaluating the sound level. But there also, I think we need expertise. And of course, we need car manufacturers, acousticians working in the car industry and, and cycle acoustics uh, looking into this. So we hit there again, if you have expertise, if something is happening, if you know more about it, please contact us. We will be very happy to involve you in the development and in the, in the expertise group. And then something which should be ready on the 3rd of March, 2022, Shelley talked about it as well, is the safe listening uh, guidelines for entertainment venues. Now question is, do you have other ideas? Do you have a feeling that there are other devices, other aspects of which that would need more safe listening guidance, where we should develop better information, better quality standards? What should we do? If you have ideas, please share it in the chat or send it later to Shelley, to me, so we can include it because we want to make a world where people's hearing shouldn't be damaged by unsafe listening practices. And that's what we want to develop. Now, what about this uh, WHO Global Standard for Safe Listening Entertainment Venues? As Shelley said, it was already, we had an information se uh, session on the 21st of September. Ian Wiggins, that has, who has contributed a lot to this uh, proposal and standard, he came with an overview. And feature number one is you have to set the upper lev uh, sound level limit. Now, we'll go a little more in depth in a second, what is already happening in practice. Typically, you would measure that sound level over a certain period, so LEQ or in 15 minutes or in one hour. There are different levels which are advised. But that is not all. How do you monitor those sound levels? And we know there's a lot of debate and discussions going on how to do this right. And it's, it's a little shame that everybody, every time we should invent the wheel again, there are good common practices that are already there. And that is why the idea is to really make them very clear, very practical and pragmatic, how to do it in the right way. You also see that if uh, a policy evaluation has to check, uh, where should you check that? How should you monitor it? The third one is uh, the venue acoustics and sound system design. Uh, I think it's the, the days are over that you had one big loudspeaker in the front uh, uh, at the front scene, and then uh, somebody standing close to that uh, has completely damaged hearing. Why a person sitting at the end of the row doesn't hear a thing anymore? That is not good sound design. You can make sound much better distributed. You can ensure better sound quality in a very good way if you develop that right. Then the provision of hearing protection. Uh, in a lot of instances, the sound, the upper sound level is too high just to be working on its own. So you need hearing protection to combine that. But then how do you do that right? Do you offer it free of charge? What kind of protection do you offer? And then including quiet areas. And that's also new because I think giving your ears a rest, what should that quiet area be all about? How to handle that right and how to promote that? And that is what is now in development in that new global standard. And we need all of you to help us promote that and to convince governments to start adopting them and turn them into policies. So in our Make Listening Safe work group, what do we do? We have, in fact, four key objectives. One is the, the first one is the most difficult one. It's to increase awareness of the importance of safe listening and to change behavior for the target group being very young people. And I know that's, uh, that's a quite a challenge, but I think that's what we need to do. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. The other one is objective to convince smartphone and headphone manufacturers to implement the WHO ITU global standard for safe listening devices. And also now to convince them to have them tested, to, to look at the conformance uh, uh, document and to really promote the fact that they have these smart listening devices. ITU is supporting us big times into this and we have more stakeholders helping us to achieve this goal. Objective three, and that's what will be needed for the global standard for safe listening venues, is to convince policymakers, governments to adopt it. And that's why we need a lot of stakeholders on board to help us to do that. We can't do it on our own. It's not WHO that can call the shots. I think it's a lot of people we need to involve here to make this implemented. 
And the fourth one, and I think the, an audience here is probably also consisting of a lot of these people, is to inform sound engineers, event organizers, musicians, the music industry, recording companies, and others about our safe listening standards and guidelines, and of course, the venue standard as well. So our technical group and our expert group have already developed multiple aspects. There was a publication from, from Elizabeth Francis Beach. They, we have made, they have made multiple reports on what is happening. If you look at the maximum peep level now, like LEQ 15 minutes in, in the Flemish part of Belgium, that is set at 102 dBA. In Brussels, it's less than 100 dBA, but then for a longer period, for an LEQ of 60 minutes, in France, they have also set it to 122 uh, dBA LEQ 15 minutes. Switzerland, uh, again, 100 dBA LEQ 60. You see, you see it, it, there's a difference in how long you measure, how long you calculate that average, and how you set the level. But that is typically high, right? I think that is more than, than typically you would be exposed to in, in, in a safe way. So that is why hearing protection plays a role. And that is why at that moment, the use of hearing protection is, is a good idea because if you look at the other logic of the ITU standard is that exposure should be limited to 80 dBA for 40 hours. Yeah, 102 is more than that, let's be clear. So we have to do something about it. And that is why if you wouldn't protect your ears at the concert, you could only listen to 18.8 minutes and then you would have your full week of exposure. Uh, mostly concerts are longer than 18 minutes, 18 minutes. So I think it makes sense to do something about it. And for children, it would be only six minutes, by the way. So that is why earplugs should be provided and they should lower the level in round about 20 dB. Can they do that? Yeah, typically they can. They have about a, a 10 dB attenuation that is possible. But then the issue is that young people don't like to use earplugs. They claim they're uncomfortable. They claim they destroy the sound quality. They claim they make understanding speech very difficult. So there's a lot of reasons why they are not using them. And actually, if you look at this study from Eurisco, it's kind of disappointing. You see there's no country in which hearing protection is used more than 15 in 15% 15 of the cases when people know that they are exposed to louder sounds than is, so it's harmful for their hearing. So I think we need to bridge that gap. In a recent publication from Crutzen, they talk about a promotion scheme, uh, a health promotion scheme to help increase this level. And they see that they move to 23%. So it's an increase from 14 to 23, but let's be fair, that's still quite disappointing. Uh, the good thing is the 14% is in fact the same as we found in the other study we're looking into. So they seem to comply, but it needs to be much more than that. And that's what we need to work on. That is why at our uh, audiology department in Antwerp at Thomas More, we had a study looking into, are these things real? Are they facts or are they myths? And we looked into a speech understanding and noise with a speech and noise test. And there we found the first thing, which is not true, because understanding in a noisy environment is even easier with hearing protection in your ears than with open ears. So that is not an excuse not to use it. In a, a noisy environment, in fact, it's even helping to have some hearing protection. And it's, it's, if it's not the same, it's a little better. What about the attenuation? Well, you see that most of those systems do attenuate about 20 dB, but some attenuate a little too much. And typically the cheap hearing protection, the foam protection is attenuating too much at the high frequencies, which could explain why people complain about sound quality. And that's what you see here. We had a subjective evaluation of music sound quality. And you see right away the orange tip here, which is the foam protection, scoring very low. Not so surprising because if you lose high frequencies, the sound of the music is not as crisp. It's different. You miss some information. And it's better to use custom-made or instant-fit reusable hearing protection that has music filters. And the same goes for comfort. We see also that the instant reusable uh, hearing protection or custom-made protection with filters is typically much more comfortable when wearing. So that is why we came to these conclusions that all of these myths that we have seen are contradicted depending on what you use, because they seem to be true when you talk about foam disposable hearing protection that is typically handed free of charge, except not understanding a noise. But all the rest seems to be correct. But if you use systems with filters, most of, the, the, of these issues are solved. 
And then the question is, is it such a smart idea that we promote to use the, 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 the fact that uh, event organizers need to distribute foam hearing protection free of charge? Because it's counter uh, productive, because if then young people experience a bad sound quality or uh, other issues, they will not change behavior. So we maybe need to find smarter ways to make better uh, hearing protection available. And it's also much more friendly for the environment because after a concert now, you, instead of seeing a lot of uh, typical waste of uh, uh, your, your sweets and stuff like this, you see waste of earplugs, which is not the idea. I think make it reusable. So what about promoting? And that's the last part we're promoting. Like if you look into for young people, what we need to do is that we need to motivate them. We need to inform them. We need to encourage the use of hearing protection. We need school programs and school books to talk much more effectively on how we can protect our ears in a good way. We need musicians to talk to young people and promote safe listening. We need more information and typically the real source of information today is Wikipedia. So I think we have a scene there and we have a Wikipedia page, let's inform them. We need to have better digital campaigns because young people don't read the books all the time. I think we need things that attract them in a good way. And of course we can use the LinkedIn group. So all of this needs to be done. Also events like this, uh, the Danish Sound Cluster uh, special session of Make Listening Safe. Of course, we need to be there and help promote it. That's also what we are doing right away, talking at different conferences, making the WHO guideline available, share learnings from other countries that have done it, promote and share information on the importance of safe listening, create make listening sessions at conferences and large events, also for a wider public, not only preaching to the converted and to the audiologists and to the sound engineers, but to all of them. And then last but not least, this is the fact, I think we were quite happy that we could, uh, we had the uh, American, uh, the Audio Engineering Society helping us uh, to, to create good documents, to create a good session on safe listening, provide clear quality documents, uh, focus also on the sound distribution in a venue, promote good sound design venues and events. I think UNESCO Week of Sound also promoted the, the, the film cast festival in Cannes on the best sound experience, how and why to create quiet areas, clear guidelines on how to measure, celebrate good examples because all of them are our heroes. And that is why we need all of you. I will share these links. Please come and join our Make Listening Safe LinkedIn group. You're very welcome. We will make sure you get access. Please visit our Wikipedia page. And if you see some things that can be improved, inform us and we will help you to do it. And please become a member of the World Hearing Forum and join us and the other stakeholders in doing all of this. So thank you for giving us the chance to talk here and to promote what you're doing. And I'm very interested to hear, to hear from the other presenters at the session, what we can do more about safe listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for a very informative uh, presentation. Um, we have had a lot of uh, questions in the regular chat. If you can find your way to the Q&A chat, which is just next to the regular chat, it just have two small bubbles and it says Q&A below. It will give us a small advantage in administering uh, the questions and, and answers. So three things, uh, Mark, and we are pressed for time. So your quick answers. First thing, our hearing aids uh, required to have the same uh, limits as the PSAPs, weekly doses limits. Are they allowed to deliver more sound because of the person's existing hearing loss? Uh, yeah, there are different guidelines. So people with hearing loss, it's different. The maximum output is set by a professional, by a hearing care professional, and they have to evaluate people's uh, uh, sensitivity. Max output has to be regulated and set, but it's not the same for PSEs because PSEs is for people with normal hearing, while hearing aids are for people with hearing loss. So it's different. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. And then there was a question about virtual reality devices. I'm, I'm guessing a little bit that, but it might uh, uh, relate to the helmets uh, and uh, these, uh, which are sort of a little bit um, irregular headphones, uh, so to speak. Um, would you consider these to be included in the current standards for headphones? I think it's quite interesting to check that because if they are used in gaming, gaming right now is not included and it's not in the scope of the current standards, but it's part to be in. So let's have a look into this and we need to study that further. 
before we can uh, really give a clear answer to that. And then the third question before we move on, um, uh, relating to indoor sports stadium, there's also a comment relating to other uh, hobbies such as um, uh, dance studios, ice rinks, etc. Uh, where uh, Shelley has uh, responded already for us that these are not currently included. Um, do you think that they can be included with the standards in progress or do you think we need to develop uh, specific standards for this? Typically, these kind of open space events may need a different implementation of the standard because sometimes the natural sound is so loud, <laughs> right? You need to look at the difference between amplified sound and the natural sound indoor. but. I think it may be smarter to use a specific uh, standard for those specific circumstances. I think it makes more sense. Thank you. I think we have uh, to move on in the interest of time. Yes. Shelly? Dorte, that the standard which is currently under development applies to places where amplified music is being played. So even if that is a fitness class, uh, it would apply to that space but it does not apply to uh, sport, uh, sporting arenas uh, and so on. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, we may have a little bit of uh, time at the end of the day where we can catch up on any remaining question. Please try to see if you can find the Q&A question chat uh, rather than the regular chat. It will give a small advantage in, in, the, in seeing all the comments. Um, and then the next speaker, this is Marcel Koch, um, who has uh, founded the Dutch company DB Control and it offers specialized uh, consultancy in sound level control for large events. Um, please, Marcel. Isn't it Jacob first? Um, I have you as a speaker now. Oh, that's okay, um, problem. Would it make sense if Jakob went first? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Running order. Well, <laughs> sorry, uh, maybe my confusion. <laughs> I'm sorry about that if I may have the order wrong. Um, we, we can uh, take Jakob, that's uh, fine. Uh, this is, uh, if you agree, Jakob. I'm totally fine, all good. Um, so Jakob is a background in live sound and has worked with Vega for many for five years. He has developed an innovative uh, software and hardware solution, the Tenisti, that provides audio professionals with the tools for great system analysis and monitoration. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Jakob, and I'm sorry about the confusion if, if I have the list wrong. All good, Dor. I've, I've been more confused this morning. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And, and, and thanks for, for having a, a opportunity to speak today with, with the past 18 months of pandemic, just even being back to having loud concerts being an issue is, 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 is good. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy we get to, to talk today. Um, I intend to, to share some of, of the following things here. Um, I'll be spending about, I think, 15, 20 minutes to, to try to cobble some food for thoughts about the scope of the challenge with, with, with live concerts and the reality of the industry today. And um, I'll start with a few facts from the, from the industry and then look outside our own little universe and, and try and, and, and pick some best practices um, from, from outside uh, live sound. Then take a look at the status quo in our industry when it comes to legislation. And, and Mark already sort of, of hinted to this so, we, so we, can, we can save some time here. Um, and then I will, will give a very quick look at, at, at Tenisi as a potential tool, uh, tool for, for this uh, aspect number two of, of, of the standard to, to really monitor sound. And my hope is that you will take away um, the reflection that loud noise is indeed harmful to your hearing, that there is no way around it, um, that concerts and live events on a broad scale is a potential source of hearing impairment. We, we've already seen this in some of the, the previous slides, but also acknowledge that most people, to most people, live shows and, and live events of all sorts is, is only a fraction of the exposure that they have uh, on an average year and every, every average week. Um, and it may not be the biggest concern for their health over time, but clearly there is, there's still uh, things we need to, to do and consider as, as an industry. Um, just to get started here with a, a, a establishing a few facts. Um, exposure, as I said, to loud noise is a risk, obviously. Um, it's well documented. It is also well documented that a, a live show 
that averages about 100 dBA, um, which is a very typical level for a, a, a concert. Uh, you can only run that for about 15 minutes, then you use your day exposure if you assume the, the health and safety standards for, for workers, so eight hours of, of 85 dB. Mark presented a, a slightly different figure, but uh, for, for, for uh, 40 um, hours a week, but the logic is still the same. Concerts are, are not something you should endure for, for a long time um, uh, per day from a, a health perspective. Um, However, and this is the conundrum, we need to recognize that the business model for the event industry as a whole is to create noise. That's what people are buying. They buy a ticket to go see a show. So the, the noise we, we sell is a fundamental for, for, for us to operate as, as an industry. Um, and last but not least, people want this, right? We, we, we do this on a voluntary basis. We even pay good money to go see live shows. Um, and this is really the, the, the in a nutshell, we, we know loud, not loud sounds are potentially hazardous to our hearing and could impact our ability to enjoy music over, over years. Yet millions and millions of people actively pursue this leisure time activity. Um, so, so we need to find a way to, to solve this conundrum. I took the, ch the chance for this call today to reflect on what does this look like outside audio? When, what, what if we remove audio from the equation altogether? What, what does this look actually look like? And um, I, I came up with uh, a few things. This guy, for instance, he is uh, jumping off a cliff uh, with a rubber band tied to his feet right it's, it's it's a bungee jump and jumping off a cliff with a rubber band is a very poor survival strategy if you will um, yet many people do this voluntarily on vacation and traveling because it's it's exciting um, the bungee jump industry actually has reportedly fewer casualties per hundred thousand jumps than traffic right it's less risky to jump in a rope uh, out of a cliff than it is to commute to work and why? And that's because the industry came together and created best practices and, and standards for how you, you make this leisure activity safe. The same goes for, for something like scuba diving. And nitrogen bubbles in the brain is definitely not uh, something to be toyed around with, but we still jump in the water with the oxygen tanks on our back because it's amazing what you get to see underwater on a coral reef. The scuba industry is also very well regulated through ISO standards. And there are, of course, um, injuries every year, but they are also maximum, you know, really try to be kept at a very low level um, to manage the balance between the risk and the leisure time activity herein. Um, last but not least, throwing punches in each other's faces, right? Boxing is very popular, whether it's tire boxing or kickboxing or normal boxing, and getting a hit to the head is not healthy. Um, Yet people still pursue this leisure time activity because it's good exercise. If, 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 if sweating and jumping around is, is your thing, this is really a way to, to get to do that. Um, so also here, you have headgear, you have uh, gloves, you have, if you even choose to combat in, in, in boxing sports, you, you have, there are rules of engagement. When do you stop hitting each other, et cetera? All of this is a little abstract, but if you start tying it back to what I just showed, you may start to see the parallel here, right? But, but just to make it sure, like these industries, like bungee jump, like, like scuba diving, um, and like, like, like boxing, the event industry, the live sound industry offers an amazing recreational joy to millions of people, obviously from, from fact number four here. But we also know that we induce risks because it's loud. It's too loud from a health perspective. Um, and, 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 and we as an industry need to manage this in the same way as it is done with, with, with the previous examples, right? So this is why I'm so happy for this call today, because it involves creating common codes of conduct, standards, and even working with legislative bodies uh, to add proper rules, which is what Make Listening Safe is, is really tremendously progressing um, uh, on, on a global scale here, right? Um, the entire premise of this industry is to produce sound levels that exceed general recommendations. There's no way around it, right? So we need to accept that, can, that concerts and, and, and other events can and should never be governed to be 100% safe from a hearing standpoint, but we clearly need to, to own the responsibility to protect the, the customers of, um, of this industry and, and keep them coming back. So that was a little bit about the the facts of, 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 of or the logic, at least, with, with which I, I, I go into this. Um, we're talking a little bit about the status quo of, of, of the industry. Um, and I picked three different cases. Um, Mark alluded to this early on as well. 
there is no global standard for conscious. There is no standard uh, no fixed uh, system in place. Um, and, and we're gradually getting there, right? Um, the picture on your screen now is from Tivoli in Copenhagen, a uh, well-known uh, amusement park, very old. Um, here is one way of implementing sound limitations and to protect audience and also protect the neighbors because they're also part of the equation, right? If you want to have your sleep Friday night at, at 11, but there's a rock show next door, you don't sleep well. And that's also not uh, good for you. The situation in Tivoli is not ideal, but it's one possible outcome due to the lack of, of national laws, right? Um, where this microphone is positioned, um, you're, a, you're supposed to not exceed 77 decibel A-weighted over time, over an hour. So 777 decibels A-weighted. In other words, you're hosting a concert in this in this wonderful garden here with somewhere between 20, uh, 10 and 30,000 people in the audience in the middle of a noisy capital and you're expected to both measure as well as stay within the limits, uh, which is frightening close to the noise floor of the city itself on a Friday at 9 p.m. with a cheering crowd and, and sometimes they're even generous enough to put a VIP buyer in next to the mixing console. Um, you basically are mixing on a ghetto blaster, which is very distant um, at, at these levels. Um, so it is a challenging environment to produce a show in, uh, but even more importantly, um, the cheering crowds and, 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 and the audience there very often complain about the fact that, that hearing the concert is hard because next to you, there's a drunken couple, drunken couple discussing what they had to for dinner, which is gradually getting louder than the actual show. So Tivoli together with their audio provider has done an amazing work in trying to sort of make sure uh, that, that the sound design and, and, and the venue is laid out in a way where the concert noise stays within the perimeter of, 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 of this carton, but sound travels, right? So they've done a lot of efforts, but it's still kept at a very low level, um, which is not necessarily what we're looking to do here. Um, at least it needs to be at a really reasonable level, right? Another good example, and, and, and Marcel, who will be uh, talking after me, uh, knows this place very well. This is the Lowlands in, in the Netherlands. Um, the other solution is local efforts to achieve a healthy balance. Uh, Lowlands is in the middle of a, 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 a natural reserve, um, a sanctuary, if you will. Um, I've chosen to pick a little more on, on something which is local to Denmark, which is the Roskilde Festival, because here the, 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 uh, the scope is the same. These large festivals, these national leading festivals um, and the voices of them has taken clear steps to insert a holistic thinking in tight partnership with, with local authorities and, and even the neighbors here. Uh, Roskilde has for more than I think 20 years or so measured the noise at each stage and to make sure it didn't keep increasing, to make sure that um, they actually sought out to reduce levels as much as they could, still within the premise of producing a rock festival, if you will. Um, since 2007, they've been using uh, the Tunisia product I will show in a minute uh, for all stages, all with a clear desire to have a, a, a well accepted and well communicated sound policy for the festival, which is created in collaboration with both the municipal office and even representatives of the neighboring community to really strike this pragmatic balance between we need to have festivals but we also need to take care both of the audience. Um, they're there for a full week. It's a lot of concerts um, as well as uh, those who live around it. Obviously, if you have 100,000 people in your backyard, it's a nuisance, right? Um, so, so this is all about managing expectations with all the stakeholders. I'm personally a huge fan of this pragmatic approach, um, but the problem is here really, you, it heavily relies on the relationships and the skills, uh, both people and technical skills from the actual festival who is involved the authorities who govern the, the permits and, 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 and the legislation in the area, because it, it, it comes down to, are you able to work out a good solution with those in power? And it's not always the case, and therefore you have to go reinvent the wheel every time, festival by festival. And here is where uh, some of the guidelines that Mark laid out is, is going to be a tremendous help to sort of streamline the efforts done here to really make concerts enjoyable, but also uh, well-maintained from a, from a, a hearing uh, and health uh, hazard standpoint. And the last one we can skip pretty quickly because Mark already talked about this. There are national legislation in place like uh, Switzerland, Sweden has it, France, uh, parts of Belgium have it by now. The challenge with the national laws today are that they are a, um, they are a, a result of what ha has been done and who was asked. Switzerland is a prime example of a place where they probably reined it in a little too much. It's nearly impossible to play concert at, at what I would call a reasonable level 
in Switzerland because the rules are very strict. And that makes for somewhat disengaging concerts. And, and you even have bands who choose to not play in Switzerland because they're, they are not comfortable with presenting the product, i.e. the concert, to an audience at that level, right? And again, this is why having a, a more global standard that you can look to, which is well-defined based on evidence and, and, and with the power of WHO to support it, this will really help us uh, progress this topic. Um, so status in a nutshell here is there is regulations. Um, there are pragmatic approaches, and that seems to be to allow for a healthy compromise between a risk to nuisance and experience of concerts, but a much more clear and streamlined national, even regional code of, of, of conduct built on best practices from the industry would most likely benefit all the stakeholders um, and remove the excessive workload that, that many organizers and authorities have about individual cases from venues and, and concerts and festivals. So with that in mind, I would like to show you a, a quick glimpse of what uh, Tanisi do uh, before we sort of wrap everything up and, and open the floor for, for any questions that have, have come in. So, in a nutshell, um, Tunisia was designed to bridge the gap between the complexity of, of noise limits, um, regardless of what they are, um, and the person behind the fader or, or at the volume control in, in, in the broadest possible sense. Sound engineers and DJs and organizers have a lot on their plate and the deep understanding of how decibels work and how to measure and all this stuff is not really in scope for them. They have other things to care for. And, and therefore, Tenisi was designed to help them avoid making mistakes and make life easy to remain compliant or at least have a proactive approach to, to the noise you, you send to your audience. Again, measuring and displaying equals managing. If you're not showing how loud you are, you don't know how loud you are. Um, and you may fly blind, right? Uh, from, from experience for, as a former touring engineer, you're on an, an airplane, you're on a nightliner for, for days and nights, you don't get sleep, you may even attend a party, you have a cold. Your hearing as a touring engineer is not necessarily at its best shape on day seven of the week. Um, and therefore you may tend to be louder than you think you are. And therefore measuring is important in whatever sense and shape you do it. Um, we've, we've had uh, PhDs and, and, and tests done on, on the importance of just showing how loud you are. Um, and some of the, the, the studies that have come in it clearly indicates that even without imposing a limit, just simply showing how loud you are, you reduce the sound levels by two to three dBs. And, and following what Mark showed about this uh, energy equivalent pr principle, a, a concert which is uh, three dB lower than it would have been without being monitored is actually putting the audience to half the exposure at the same level of enjoyment. So it's, it's worth keeping an eye on how loud you are. Right? So Tanis is essentially consists of a dedicated USB platform. You need a dedicated hardware because you need the calibration to make sure you're accurate with the uh, measurements. And you also need a calibration which can't be you know, changed if you don't like what you're seeing on the screen. So it's a dedicated platform. You cannot change it. You need to you know, physically modify the microphone to not have an accurate measurement about how loud you are. It then couples that hardware with a, a piece of software which is designed to really speak to engineers and DJs. Uh, you can see the usual metrics from doing sound level measurements, but the, but the main point is to make sure that once you're measuring a show under an average, which most shows are, you, you saw Mark talking about one hour or 15 minutes, and Marcel will touch this as well. If you're mixing over time, what you do right now impact you an hour from now or half an hour from now, and you may not be aware of the damage you do to yourself. And Tanisi helps you understand right now what you're doing right now and how that impacts your ability to perform the concert um, uh, going forward here. Um, and of course, at the end of the, everything, there's a comprehensive uh, log file and everything you need to do to document the event to authorities or to quality control within your own uh, organization after the show. So this is Tanisa in a nutshell, dedicated system, works on uh, a PC and a attempt to make it easy to uh, really keep an eye on what you're doing um, as a engineer, a DJ or someone else playing reinforced sounds. As always, if you're curious to know more, um, my information will be available after the show and, and, and I encourage you to go to c10easy.com. So with all that being said and time about to come up, um, let's have a look here. The event industry as a whole really has matured. When I started doing this in 2005 or six, the notion was if you do sound level limits, bands will not play. Uh, it's, it's part of the artistic freedom to be as loud as you want to be. Thankfully, that logic has changed over the past two decades and it's widely accepted by now also within the touring environment and, 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 and concerts 
that you need to take, you, know, you need to keep an eye on this. Um, so we have matured as an, an industry, um, we can still do more. And, and this is why the work that WHO is doing here is, is and, and make listening safe is so important. Um, we definitely need to keep the rules pragmatic. Friction is created when the limits are below what seems to make sense. Uh, Tivoli being a good example of, it's probably a little too tight for really achieving a, a good compromise between customer experience, i.e. concert experience, and then um, what we want to achieve in terms of, of taking care of the audience and the neighbors. I was thrilled to see the awareness slides because I, I'm of the firm opinion that awareness here is key. And the reason why awareness is key is that as much as we know concerts are allowed, really let's make the impact where it matters the most. People wear headsets for hours on end, every day, commuting to work, going to school, at their leisure time, they game, they do all this stuff. The concerts are loud and they're easy to point at because you can hear them from a distance. So it's easy to recognize that this is loud. But when you measure a concert versus what's going on in your ears with a, a pair of modern hair, headphones, they are damn close. Um, so eight hours a day of headphones is way more than what you usually would attend concerts in a year. And that really is the, the message today is let's make sure that we keep the good work up for concerts. Let's make sure we are conscious about the, the risks that we as an audio industry expose to the, to the audiences. But also let's make sure we educate everyone about the need to not just care for concerts, but the general exposure of, of noise as a whole. And with that, I want to say thank you and head it back to, to Dorda for any follow-up questions. Thank you, Jakob, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, we do have a few comments in, in the chat. Uh, we also have a comment from someone who's not able to, to write into the Q&A uh, chat. So maybe we have a technical problem on that because I can see no one has actually That's made it to the that's yeah. me, actually. Sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> because I'm in the panel, I cannot write in the Q and A. Okay. Anyway, yeah. um, one question that I noticed um, is uh, whether, if you don't have amplification, whether it's relevant also to monitor in a similar way. Um, would you respond to that one, Jakob? Or? I can try. I mean, uh, classical music is a well-known case of people with hearing impairment. If you play the violin for eight hours every day, you you ultimately damage your hearing. It's a loud instrument when you're close by. I would make the argument that it's more a case of personal protection here than it is a, a case for, for reinforced because the typical sound pressure for the audience at, at acoustic events is not at a point where I would say it's, it's jeopardizing anyone's hearing, but for the individual practitioners of, of, of classical and, and, and acoustic music, definitely. Um, it's, it's a challenging topic that's been covered in many surveys because it's difficult to wear hearing protection when you're playing the violin because of the occlusion effects, um, so yes. For, for practitioners of the music, yes. it's, it's a challenge, yeah. Thank you, and I very much agree. Um, and there were several questions also in the chat, actually al already back to Mark's presentation relating to occupational health and safety. And maybe we should uh, emphasize that today is uh, more about the leisure exposure. Um, there's um, standards and regulations in place uh, for the protection in work environment. And in, in this case of the musicians, of course, there's also professional organization which has to attend to the musician's health, um, which is uh, often a very difficult balance because they need to practice. So they do need to expose themselves to relatively high levels, uh, not, not just during performance, but also during practice time. So let me see if I missed any further questions. I think there was uh, one question relating to whether it's relevant for studio engineers also to use 10 easy in, in the, um, when, when mixing. Um, my guess is that uh, it's the playback level anyway that controls exposures. Uh, so, but uh, Jakob, is it relevant? I mean, I'd, I'd love to sell it to an easy to every student in the world. That would make me a happy man. It's a for-profit business. But generally speaking, I think it's shooting uh, you know, barrel and sparrows with a gun. Um, you definitely should keep an eye on your mixing environment because as you listen fatigue over the day, you tend to crank it up. And not only do you sit for hours in the studio and listen to louder and louder music, which by virtue of what Mark shared is an exposure you should take care of, but you'll also find the next day when you come back, the mix you did at 2 a.m. is not really what you thought it was because you, your ears was heavily impacted by the exposure throughout the day. So yes, I would advise everyone who has a studio to have some sense of understanding for how loud they're mixing it. It will help them in many ways, not just with their hearing. Thank you, very relevant. 
Um, I don't have any more questions in the chat, and I think probably also in the interest of time, uh, we should move on uh, to Marcel. And thank you for uh, bearing with me uh, with the order <laughs> presentations. Um, Marcel. Yeah, you're muted, Marcel. Yeah, I, I cannot on. I found it. Yes. Yes, perfect. And now the presentation. Uh, okay, it should be full screen now. Yes, perfect. Okay, then I will start. Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Marcel from the Netherlands, chief of uh, DB Control since many years. And I'm working as an acoustic consultant, primarily in uh, the Netherlands and in Belgium at large events and mostly outdoor events. Doing consultancy before the event, doing measurements during the event and make a report after the event. There's also a DB Control Norway, uh, Thomas in Trondheim. You see the email addresses for uh, any questions. The slides will be available after this webinar. Um, I have two parts. The first part is about a festival in Belgium, how to do things around that. And the second part is some upcoming uh, uh, papers about research for the Make Listening Safe Working Group. Uh, the case is the beautiful Paradise uh, City Festival in August in uh, Belgium. It was allowed to do festivals around 10,000 visitors each day. Um, the City Festival, Paradise City Festival is near Brussels in Belgium. You see some uh, beautiful pictures. Uh, there was a heavy rain a few days before, so my car tires were uh, rather muddy, but everything went well. You see the castle at the left corner. Beautiful environment, beautiful festival. Music style is merely techno. The local uh, city council uh, has decided back in 2018 to do a sound level limit of 96.5 dBA averaged over one hour. And since Perk is in the Flanders region, you should think it's 100 dBA at 60 minutes. But local government can do, decide to go lower. If they want that, they can do that. Not higher, but they can go lower. Why 96.5? Well, there was one political party who said 95, and there was another political party who said 98. And as a compromise, as always in politics, 96.5 that's rather easy to go um you put up your uh, 10 easy measurement computers at four areas at front of house and you think well that is easy work i only have to enter 96.5 at 60 minutes and there is a little trick in 10 easy when you use control e you get a little pop-up screen and you can enlarge that screen and then you have one screen one number Easy going, work is easy. Not really, uh, there's more difficulties to come. Um, the average time of 60 minutes is most of the time too long to interpret by the sound engineer. It's like an oil tanker who is uh, going on and on and on. And before it stops, you should do that hours before. I will talk about that later. So, to prevent uh, uh, limit violations, I have put an extra limit voluntarily of 15 minutes. That's usual. Uh, sound engineers are most uh, of the time used to a shorter time period. So this is the sheet for the front of house. 96.5 at 60 minutes, 80, and 98 dBA at 50 minutes. If you stick to the 98, you will be safe for an hour. That's my experience. So here's the screen, um, upper left corner, uh, LQ for an hour, DBA. Uh, in the middle, lower is uh, LQ 15 minutes, and you get the C weighting uh, added to it, and the LP slow. But that's not all. One of the stages, um, it has small, smaller stages, and a rather long distance between the stage barrier, the sound system, and the front of house. 
you see the picture is taken to the left and to the right. It's around 35 meters. When you put up your front of house uh, at 35 meters, you can go up to the limit, but that means that in front of the stage or halfway, you have a higher level. And that was a discussion point in 2018. So I was keen on that and I said, we do a comparison measurement. We use brown noise because brown noise has, when played over PA systems, um, a spectrum similar to uh, modern dance music. It's a difference of about 13 to 14 dB between the C and A weighting. And as a result, I measured at point A and point B, and I noticed a difference of around 2.5 dB. And the Ten Easy computer has the option to do that measurement, and you can add the 2.5 dB to your information. So the readout at point B is almost the same as the level measured in point A. Is that it? No, we're not finished. The Paradise City Festival near a castle is near a residential area with houses where, which are not quite cheap. And believe me, the people who live there have um, much influence in the local politics. So as a solution, um, I added an informal DBC limit to the sheet. No, not to the sheet because it's informal. I added to the screen and now it gets rather complicated from one DBA in the beginning to LEQ in DBA one minute. And by means of the pop-up screen, the C weighted level at one minute. And of course, where it all started, the LEQ at 60 minutes DBA. And to steer some things, you have the 50 minutes below from one simple screen to a screen full of information. And of course, the DBC is added to, um, to, to handle uh, problems from the neighbors with base frequencies. That is about a festival. Um, the second part is about uh, some upcoming papers and publications about research. And this all started with our visit uh, last year, just before Corona, in uh, Geneva. You can see the details by the web link just under the screen. And we met each other, not all were there in Geneva, but um, some of us uh, enjoyed in a little group. There are many more experts involved in the Make Listening Safe group. We have all kinds of contacts. And we um, have figured out three publications which are accepted by the Journal of the Audio Pensioning Society. And what we do is um, we have done a survey uh, worldwide uh, among sound engineers. More than 2,000 engineers replied on the survey. We think every day about new parameters, uh, timeframes, how to handle uh, a large and acute timeframes. We do research uh, at music events, and we think about how to control the limits and the levels. Um, about the survey, uh, a short summary, uh, more than 2,000 respondents in five languages, even in Mandarin, Portuguese, Spanish, French, English. And the publication is accepted and it will be available end of 2021 or maybe in January. As a result, I will show one result, is that sound engineers prefer the most the 15 minutes um, uh, time frame for the LEQ. And the second one is five minutes, and the shorter time frame of one minute is not appreciated very much. And the one hour time frame is at the end of the wish list. To show you something more about the one minute, five minute, 15, and 60 minutes, I have a set of data. It's one day of a rock and roll show starting 11 in the morning. I think it was on a Sunday 10 years ago and ending up in the evening at 11 o'clock. You see uh, the first band, second band, change over times, a band more a ballad singer-songwriter style, some louder bands. And if you present the results measured with the Tin Easy, you get a graph like this. Vertical, the DBA level, and time on the horizontal scale. One minute information. When you reprocess uh, this information to a five minute moving average, 
you get a graph like this. You see the difference, original data, five minute moving average. And you can do that at 15 minutes. You see a lot, slightly lower levels. And when you do one hour, you see even lower levels. And the disadvantage of one hour is that it, it's time lagging. I will replay it. One minute, five minutes, 15 minutes, and 60 minutes. The highest value of the 60 minutes is always one minute or two minutes after the end of the show. You will see it here. Interesting. What can you do about that? You need more information. And therefore we figured out we should do something with the moving average. The moving average was introduced by uh, Jacob in 2007 by uh, Ten Easy. Very interesting. Um, the first use of Ten Easy in the Benelux was uh, 2008 in Belgium. And from the stock quote analysis, I learned that they use a simple moving average, one day, five days, 20 days, 100 days, one year, two years. But they also use for trend analysis, the exponential moving average. You can read more about it at the web link. So we played around with a lot of data files and we figured out we have the LQ 60 minutes where every minute counts uh, equal. And we have the LQ 15 minutes where every minute counts equal. But you can play with uh, the second LQ time between one and 30 minutes, for instance. You can play with the slope of the weighting. You can even do more slopes. So the recent minutes are charged more than 10, 15 minutes ago. You can also do an exponential averaging of your last 50 minutes. And there it becomes interesting because with the smoothing factor, you can try different curves. And we figured out that the combination of the simple moving average of 45 minutes between minus 60 and minus 50, and the last 15 minutes by an exponential moving average with a smoothing factor of about 1.7, the combination of that uh, was a very good predictor for level limit violations of the one hour value. And you see here that when the green line, which is the predictor, exceeds the level limit, you should be aware of problems in the future. In the future, it means 20, 10, 15, 20 minutes ahead. And this is part three of the paper, which is accepted by the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society, I think January of December or December. Next one, Mark already told it, the, the information session in September, uh, the, uh, the consideration of the WHO is an upper sound level limit of 100 dBA at 15 minutes. Um, this, was a very, this was a very fast presentation, last slide. And now it's time for uh, questions. I think I'm just within the time frame, so there will be enough time. Yes, thank you. So we have a few questions already in, in the chat. Um, for live event, this is by Samuel Moulin, who's asking for a live event. You want to monitor sound level of the entire audience area, or at least at hot spots. Any recommendations about how to do that in a relevant way? You, you touch on it a little bit, but uh, please, Marcel. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about the measurement protocol, where to measure, how to measure, uh, include the DBC or DBA. Until now, we uh, follow uh, local country rules, and most of the time they state that you should measure at front of house. That's very practical because there's the sound engineer, there you have some space. Um, other protocols, like in Sweden and Switzerland or Germany, say no, you have to first measure at the sound check at the loudest point in the area and then convert it to the level at front of house. That makes it a little bit more difficult. And that makes it uh, more important to do a good sound system design. I think part two of the, of the research is to think of a good measurement protocol, which fits all around the world, but that's rather difficult. We are thinking about that. Thank you. 
And we also had a comment uh, about this exposure in, in studios and by studio engineers, the discussion we had just after Jakob said, many broadcast studios have listening meters as a standard, but it's rare elsewhere. I just wanted to add that because uh, it's, it's uh, quite relevant for the occupational health and safety of, of these individuals. Thank you for your presentation, Marcel. Um, interesting that uh, all three of you, uh, Mark and Jakob and, and you, took us through actually to, to help us understand the complexity um, in the nature of the problem that uh, some come to listen for the music. You would think everyone does, but uh, no. Uh, teenagers also come to talk to each other. They don't want to have their ears blocked. Uh, it's a social interaction more than anything. Um, and in your case, Jakob, actually some came, uh, they would just happen to be in a spot where they where there were music when they had to discuss something from the wedding. And then you, Marcel, you also illustrated the uh, the complexity that you have. You have neighbors that uh, are not uh, sort of enjoying the music all the time, and you also have to attend to, to that. Um, if I could ask maybe one general question, um, and I'll start with you, Marcel. Uh, what do you think that we need the most where where is the point that where we most uncertain in in the strategies that we apply um what what's the knowledge that we're missing currently um obvious the knowledge that we're missing is the use of all frequencies without waiting so a linear level and most of the time you can do that by the dbc measurement we don't know very much about the, the dangerous zone of the DBC levels. Is it 110, which is quite normal for DBC measurements? Is it 115, 118, 120? There are more than 1,000 publications worldwide over the last 100 years about the DBA and hearing damage and the chance to it. But there is very little about DBC and uh, the possibility of hearing damage. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the achievements of uh, the Make Listening Safer Working Group and the efforts on, on uh, headphone exposure is, uh, is the focus on dose rather than levels. Whereas for somebody who needs to control an event, uh, you, 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 it's very difficult to make a budget. Um, and uh, from what you've showed us so far, uh, do you have any uh, sort of suggestions for that? Uh, Jakob, do, do the 10 Easy offer any sort of uh, suggestions for how to make a budget for a, an entire concert where you can sort of classify, I want this type and uh, where to start? Currently, there's no dose because dose will, of course, also depend on where you are, right? I mean, if, if you have a, a wide audience area, it will be different. And, and, and there's been a lot of experiments done with dose meters to understand the distribution of sound over the, the, the entire site. What Tunisia does do is that it, it applies the logic of that, you know, Marshall showed this wonderful picture of the super tanker, right? That, that what yeah. you're doing right now impacts your ability to, to perform later. I, I always uh, compare this to, to a bank statement. Uh, where the, you know we insert db money at the top and you withdraw them with a the master fader at the bottom if you're running you know if you run burn you through your cash flow of db money too soon you will not be able to complete the show because you basically will need to reduce the level infinitely at some point so what tanisa does too is it it, it it uses this dose logic but on an average moving average instead and saying hey, you know what right now you're three db above what you ideally should be doing which may be, make perfect sense. It, again, it's, it's, it's the, the freedom to perform. If this is your loud song and the next three songs will be not so loud, it's, it may be totally fine to be three to be above an ideal average. That's for you to decide who is running the show. But if you're constantly at the same level because you're an electronic music fair or, or a hip hop act, which is dynamically pretty much same, same all the time, you need to consider reducing. Otherwise, you're going to run into troubles uh, very soon. So, so that's the, the logic applied by Tunisia. Exactly. You, you have to control the future. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's actually a difficult uh, game uh, also with the many interests in, in a concert. Um, would any of you consider that uh, the experience from past uh, conferences or sorry, past um, events uh, might actually eventually built into to, to the fader so that you could uh, have an artificial intelligence that would uh, help you monitor and guide you and say, well, the last time you were here and uh, this band played, 
uh, you actually made a too conservative strategy or, or the other way around. Is that something that's feasible in your opinion? And also, Marcel? Yeah, that's the next step. Um, we're thinking of a measurement protocol. And within a few weeks, I will be on some dance festival with students from the University of Ghent, measuring DBC, measuring noise dose, uh, walking around, measure at different points. But certainly the next step for uh, 2022 is uh, do something with artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, build up a database of concerts, of information about shows, type of shows, type of music. It's done in other uh, research areas, so it must be not too difficult to implement, but it has to be done. That's Thank the you. next step. Thank you. So, I'm just looking to see if I have lost anything from the chat. I think the chat uh, questions are open to everyone. So, can I ask a question to Marcel? Yes. Or maybe Jakob as well. Um, just about, well, because I studied on a ton master degree and in sound engineering, which was more studio. Uh, based, but I wonder if the the education programs for live engineers, if they have this as part of their education, like they really understand. We we were just told, yeah, protect your ears. But actually, if you're in a studio with eight other people or in a live event, no one really is telling you to go and have a break. They're telling you to get it done, you know, in this short time period. So you're quite often under time pressure. I was just wondering if you know. Maybe it's different in each country if they have a real focus on this. This one is from Jacob. <laughs> now there's, there's thankfully more, more than me out there, right? Yes and no. There are schools that bring this as part of a curriculum and, 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 and I've myself been, been teacher and also so uh, a part of the, the student programs at some of the sound engineering schools, both in Denmark and, and outside of Denmark to educate on why this is important. And, and the angle has always been, there are two reasons why this is important. First of all, this is your craft. And if you damage your hearing, it's like when the, uh, the, ca the, the carpenter cuts his fingers off with a saw. You cannot work if you don't have a hearing in audio, right? So you need to protect your career by being smart with how you expose yourself to, to loud levels. But the other part of it is also the whole idea of, we have, and there's someone who brought it up that there is, there is standards for listening levels in, in broadcast, right? And that's, there's a good reason for that. You can only cram so much down on, a, on a, a vinyl record, you can only cram so much into a satellite link, and you can only cram so much audio into your ears before they actually don't work the way you want them to. So, so awareness on how loud, loud you are, it's not just about the nanny state protecting you from your own rights. It's really about making sure that you do the best possible job because there are confinements also within our hearing systems that you need to adhere to. And, and, and the more you know about them, the more awareness to come back to Mark slides that you have about that this is actually a constraint within the environment of audio, I think the better we all do as, as, as performers and artists within, within the space. Thank you. You just need the brave, the brave uh, mentor, the sound engineer to <laughs> a studio manager, for example, to like lead the way because I haven't witnessed that. Yeah. Awareness is key, anywhere. right? Even under time pressure, if you make for 10, 10 hours a day, you know, awareness is key here. Yeah, yeah. Or 16 hours a day is normal in some. In, it, it is. That's kind of no, what people do. So Get it over the finish line, right? It's worrying, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have a few questions coming up. Um, first, I think a comment from John Burton. Uh, we need to be able to respond as engineers to the dynamics of the music to maintain the excitement that those dynamics provide, um, which I think we can all agree. Uh, it is a live event. We want it to be live. We don't want to, we want, don't want to limit, you know, the fun at the end of the game. And that's actually why we're trying to, to have tools and practices that uh, give us the ability to steer the super tanker. Um, and then we have um, JADB, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, what defines loss of hearing according to the World Health Organization? Is it a decreased frequency range pickup or a decreased perceived loudness of sound or is it both? Um, who would want to, maybe you, Mark? Yeah, sure. And, and if you don't mind, I will also post where you can find the world report on hearing because it's uh, looking into this. By the way, the, 
the definitions and the different levels of hearing loss have been redefined by WHO. Uh, but it's, it, it's indeed a very good question because on the one hand, typically hearing loss is defined based on the level at which you start to hear different frequencies. And there's the, this whole idea about hidden hearing loss. I think, uh, I think I talked about Kujawa and Mao's experiments where they say that if you have been exposed to loud sounds, right? At some point you will have a, a temporary hearing loss, but that will recover later and you start to hear back to normal at your basic level. But it turns out a lot of these people have an issue how they process and how they hear louder sound levels. So you need to be quite careful. Uh, so that is why when we look into how you convince people of what is happening, I think we're a big fan of speech and noise testing. And that is why WHO has this uh, here WHO test, which is numbers and noise. Because to be fair, functionality is what you will perceive. Uh, you will, if, and if you start to perceive that you have issues understanding and noise, the, the chance that you will do something about it is much higher than if you're not able to hear very funny, strange beeps at a very low intensity. I think people don't really connect that. So the levels of hearing loss you will find in the World Report on Hearing, but also there they state that you need to look at much more than that. It's how you understand the noise, it's how you function at different levels. And, and the level at which you start to hear is a very bad quality judgment, to be fair. Yeah, thank you. Um, second uh, question, what are the different levels of loss of hearing and what level is some degree of hearing loss? And I think you responded already. Um, it's already in for, the chat now. I shared yes, the link right away. Exactly. Thank you for sharing uh, that. I can also uh, share uh, the experience that we had from, from a research project that I'm involved in, the Better Hearing uh, Rehabilitation Project, where we uh, recorded uh, statistics for for patients that would come on their own uh, to visit the audiological clinic because they had uh, the experience that they had a hearing problem which they needed uh, help for. And more than 70 of out of 2000 of these patients would have a hearing which according to the audiogram would be categorized as normal. And this is exactly also the complexity of the problem that they have some processing disorders. It's a, a hearing deficit, which isn't a sensitivity problem, but uh, something about uh, how the brain and the neural system is processing the sounds. And I think we have different types of hearing losses. And I think the best uh, definition is probably that the one that, uh, how, how difficult do you experience the functional uh, problem as you describe it. So, Polly has a question. Um, the combination of PSP technology with wireless earbuds, has, has that been considered? This is becoming more popular in consumer devices, typically labeled as hearing enhancements. Eventually, this may intersect with the over-the-counter hearing devices. In this case, which standards should be following hearing aid, PSAP, or listening devices? I really like this question, by the way, and as you may have seen in the talk, I think from the beginning at ITU, we did consider the, the wireless earbuds. And I even had a picture of a wireless earbud connected to a smart device, but I took it out because we may have some issues that people might recognize which brand it is. And I wanted to stay brand neutral when it comes to this. So it's typically in, uh, and that is part of it because it's measuring uh, the, the dose. The, the only thing is, and typically that's easy because there's normally a handshake between the headset you are using and the smart device. So the levels at which you are pro producing the sound are fairly easy to evaluate. When it comes to OTC, oh, we have had many discussions. We also had sessions with the FDA trying to convince them to go to weekly dose logic, uh, but that was very difficult to be fair. Uh, and of course you do know, I think it all depends because OTC is intended for people with mild up to moderate hearing loss. So where do you put the, 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 the boundary at some point? I hope they are inspired. And, and what we said, I think if, if it's possible to get more people to use amplification uh, and to get more people to convince to use, uh, to support their hearing, we are all open and fair to that as long as we are sure it is safe. Uh, and that's a debate going on. The FDA ruling isn't even clear yet, so it still has to be published and they're still working on it. There's still hearings going on, so it may take a while. But yeah, 
thank you for looking into that. I think uh, there's a, indeed a difference by something that people have to do, define on their own, what kind of levels they're exposed to, or smart systems that can calculate uh, weekly dose. I, I think it would be smart from those manufacturers producing also over-the-counter systems to include uh, the, the weekly dose exposure. It wouldn't hurt. And, and as you typically know, if you have a hearing loss, definitely a mild hearing loss, you typically have an issue hearing soft sounds, but your uncomfortable level, the maximum exposure level to which you should expose to isn't different from people with normal hearing. So that is why you, you may want to be quite careful with, with exposure and, and those levels for people who are using that kind of devices. But very good point. I'm very happy the question was raised. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, we have a small uh, poll coming up. Shelley, could you enlighten us? Yes, I could. <laughs> we have a couple of questions from Marcel. Um, I will just launch it now. We are down a few people. I know some people had to leave early today. Uh, so you should be able to see the two questions. The first one, which time frame do you prefer for an LEQ measurement period? And number two, are you familiar with the DBC limit? I wonder how many live engineers we have out there. And while we are Responding to this, um, I'll invite uh, more questions or comments. I have a question for myself. <laughs> why, why did you ask these questions? Is it common that people, um, you said they don't measure as long as they should? No, the question about the time frame is part of our, our worldwide survey, and it's always mm -hmm. interesting to, to do some question like this in a poll. And the use of the DBC as a, a limit is, is uh, I think, very important for the next 10 years at live events. Not only for the neighbors, but also for the ears of the audience. Do okay. we have results? Oh, sorry, yeah. Only I can see them. There we go. <laughs> One moment. Uh huh. Now you can see the results. Yeah. And now you also have to comment, Marcel, in question. Oh, any surprises in the responses? Is this what you would expect? Or? Surprised by the 60 minutes because it's, it's, it's not very popular uh, amongst sound engineers. Um, no, not surprised about the 15 minutes and not surprised about the answer to that question too. Okay. Thank and you. Will stop sharing. I'll send you this. Good. We also got the answer to the question, how many live engineers are on the call? It's 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So I, I had uh, one a little bit of a speculative one because uh, it, uh, the exposure of a given individual um, is sort of a little bit uh, placed into the category of, of, of whose responsibility it is. So if you're in a work environment, it's the uh, occupational health and safety and the employer and certain standards and rules. And, and if you enjoy music uh, riding home from work, it's uh, it's your personal device and, and how it might inform you. And if you're at a live event, it's our uh, studio engineers and uh, or sorry, our live engineers uh, and so forth. Um, and it seems that we might actually be selling, you know, uh, our hearing uh, three times during a day because we all assume that we have, you know, a full capacity of exposure, uh, whereas we might actually have uh, three uh, types of exposures to relate to. Um, do any of you anticipate that we will have sort of a way of, of mixing this uh, in the personal devices, which could monitor and you could actually digitally, digitally feed some information on, onto the device of, of uh, what kind of exposure that you, you take with you from your work environment uh, to the leisure time? I don't know who wants to. I have an answer to your first sentence when you opened. 
who is responsible for the sound level? Um, there have been some court cases, for instance, in, uh, in Germany. And most of the time, it's always the promoter to blame. He's in top of uh, command and he's responsible. Um, currently, I'm doing uh, a research with a consultancy firm in the Netherlands called Berenschot for the Dutch Ministry of uh, Health, Sports and Welfare. And the question is uh, very actual because we think it's a chain of people and companies who is responsible for it. It will be published. It's, it's a government uh, project, uh, I think, in uh, three or four months. And that will answer the first question. But I'm Thank you. not into the devices. Uh, so that's, I think, for Mark. Yes. Thank you. I would happily uh, talk to that because it's the dream scenario that we would be able to combine different exposures with different devices and different situations. Because right now, our concern is that we are, in fact, underestimating exposure big times. Uh, because if you calculate for a weekly dose and you only calculate when using a specific device with your specific headphones, you're underestimating it and you give people a false sense of doing well. And that is a risk factor at some point. And there are some discussions going on. You may be aware that there is this Apple survey analysis that they look into with Apple Watch and other devices, looking in your overall daily exposure at different situations. And maybe this is a solution that a smart device's microphone could be active in capturing. There are a few issues though, because uh, like it's illegal to have any application run when you're using a telephone call. Uh, because they are afraid that you may be listening into calls and doing stuff you shouldn't do at that moment. So there are a few limitations in this, but I think that it's something that would make sense because let's be fair, that is one of the issues. Some of the, the, the manufacturers of headphones are looking into this because they say that in fact, if you have a smart headphone, they typically reconnect their headphone to multiple devices. At least that would also play a role, uh, but it's, it, it's a tricky part. And what do you do if you have a gaming console? Do you combine that as well? Now, what is happening if you go to a live concert? Uh, how reliable is it? So I think it's, it's good that we're trying to achieve that we're not there yet, uh, but that should be the ambition that we have a better view on what is happening. Now, having said that, I have a question for Marcel and also for your question you have raised in the poll, because uh, we are limited by the fact that at WHO we can only use evidence-based information to develop material and to develop guidance and, and guidelines. And the issue is that there is so little, and you said it yourself, there's close to no evidence base on what DBC levels are doing to your hearing. So how can you define guidelines and how can we use that? Because it is used in different legislations and, and regulations. But, but the evidence based on what is doing to your hearing is lacking for the time being. So what is your idea and how do you suggest we use this? Uh, you're completely okay. right, of course. Um, the current um, national limits on DBC are just made up of a DBA plus 15. Because usually at dance music and average, we see a plus 15 at the louder bass uh, music. So everybody happy, um, but we're not aware of what's happening in 115 or 117 or 119 or 121 DBC. We don't know that. And there's always the question when measuring low frequencies, where should you measure? Do you have indoor something with small rooms and standing waves? What will be your measurement protocol? Should you average about many points and that sort of thing? So those are questions which are not answered yet. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? And thank you for your response, Mark. Um, sort of uh, the technical solutions that might help feed uh, data into uh, the various exposures. Um, this is, of course, relevant. Um, but you could also maybe take the analogy that we had earlier with the accounts that, uh, you know, you have your own uh, personal uh, account and uh, you spend money by buying something here and there. And we don't currently have a personal account on uh, where we're spending uh, our hearing. Um, and it might not require uh, 
intelligent sensors. It might just need to include information we already have if we are in a, a noisy work environment. Maybe there is an estimate for the daily exposure, and then you can feed sort of a crude average number into your health app and into your account. So I was thinking about whether this is something uh, that uh, we might also have some ideas and inspiration for. To be fair, I think right now our biggest challenge definitely for venues is to motivate people to wear their hearing protection because 15 percent at the highest this is crazy i think it is so low and, and that is that's all nice and fair because event organizers have to distribute hearing protection but the users don't need to use it right so so, so and of yeah. course you can say this is my freedom i i don't need to use my hearing protection so we need to find very kind ways of convincing them to do that and I think there are some, some links to that, right? So how do you uh, use protection against SOAS? I think that's the closest you get to, to health campaigns that can say, what do you do to, to keep having fun without having uh, running into danger? Sorry for the wording. But uh, that is probably something to look into. It needs to be a positive story. They need to be aware. I think there's a lot of misinformation because the analogy says all the way, uh, as I said from the beginning, young people say, I won't understand anybody. The, the sound will be lousy. That's the kind of fake facts at some point we need to counter, but also by providing quality hearing protection. And I think that is something we need to pay attention to. I think we need to move people to, to protect their ears in an intelligent way that can combine being protected while still having a lot of fun and while still enjoying the music as much as we can. Yeah, thank you. Now, this was also one of the things that I noted uh, in your presentation that you actually demonstrated that speech intelligibility was preserved even with the, uh, the specific type of hearing aids. Uh, obviously not if you have the sort of passive uh, hearing attenuation, which uh, takes much more of the high frequency sound. But to uh, be fair, Dorte, in a speech and noise test in a noisy environment, the, 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 the worst hearing protection, which is the foam, disposable, still didn't do worse than open ears. So it's a misperception that you don't understand the noise for the music exactly. sound quality. That's, a, that's not a different story. For, for intelligibility, it was quite OK. So we were, we were surprised by that, by the way. Yeah. And thank you. And I think that is important. This is something that you might want to create uh, an event uh, to, you know, uh, have a few volunteers uh, standing in, in a group in a crowd and to demonstrate that you can actually manage in that situation. It doesn't block you from the social interaction that you want to have, because I think it's intuitively intuitively you think I put something in my ears, then I'm, you know, the rest of the world and then there's me and um, and this, this is one of the myths that uh, we need to work on. I'm, I, I agree completely. Comments or questions? I would agree with that. Uh, I've, got, I've had some very skeptical friends, music fans, and you know, when I actually got them a pair of decent earplugs, then they, you know, you just get used to it and then it's just what you do automatically every time you go to a concert or a large place. Sometimes I even have, now, because I'm a bit paranoid about it, I wear them in like a, just a bar or a station, any kind of noisy place, and it really doesn't stop me. I can answer my phone with earplugs in or, <laughs> you know, I can just function. Um, and it really, I mean, noise is also stressful for the body and the brain. So it's a good idea. Yes, by the way, not, there's, by the way, also I, another myth that musicians can't play music correctly if they're wearing hearing protection. And that is not true. I think there's been multiple studies and experiences that if you have quality hearing protection, in fact, the way you play your music, the way you sing isn't worse at all. It just needs to be, you, you need to get used to it. That is yeah. true. But typically they even did experiments with smart pianos, checking how the piano was played while they were using uh, quality hearing protection compared to none. And to be fair, if you're experienced, you're doing just as well. But the, the, the logic is that you have to have open ears to be able to play music correctly. Uh, that is also not true. Uh, and I think in our Make Listening Safe uh, technical group, there's a lot of, uh, and stakeholder group, there's a lot of musicians now and people uh, from, from the, the music industry. And it's a challenge. But, and, and, and on top of that, the, the worst instrument to harm your ears is mostly your own instrument, because that's the one that is closest to you, by the way. So, so I think protecting your ears is, is, is working well. Thank you. So any other comments or questions? So
So maybe we should ask ourselves. Um, I, I asked it, uh, Marcel asked, what do we need the most uh, to know? Um, maybe we could do a small round. Um, I think we, we may actually, in my opinion, we have uh, very little uh, population studies from, from personal exposures, uh, from uh, headphone-based uh, playback from personal stereos, which is based on, on actual measurements of, of the exposures. Uh, by far the most studies uh, are based on, on listening durations that were estimated by individuals themselves, um, which we know to be uh, fairly awake. Uh, we do not. We don't estimate uh, listening time well. We typically overestimate uh, and uh, actually report twice the time as as it is actually. So that's one of the things that I personally think that we're missing. But uh, maybe we should make a small round and then we can volunteer whatever we we feel this is uh, something that we should look into in in future to to have a bit of uh, evidence base. Well, for myself, uh, the main question for next year is the, the proper measurement protocol, because when you measure at the loudest point in a venue or at a festival site, you protect the one person who is standing maybe one or two meters from the barrier. And at the back of the audience, the level is, is much lower. Is that a good decision or should you compromise by measurement at front of house? Yeah. Thank you. And, Mark? and for me, really, it's, it's still bridging the gap between exist, existing legislation, where concerts are, for lack of better, treated as factories, where that they're, you're supposed to reduce the noise because you want, you want to live next to the factory for your, for your entire life. That gap between what is currently available to use for legislation versus what we've discussed here today and, and the work that Make Listening Safe is doing is hopefully there to help replace the challenge of treating a concert as a factory because you cannot that's i mean we produce noise as the product so you cannot by virtue govern us under the no noise please <laughs> rules right and that's really the key challenge here is to change the framework for legislation to a point where you can make meaningful pragmatic rules and and and, and guidelines for this industry to keep entertaining the millions of people that we entertain every year yeah thank you I think from my side, I, the, the thing we need to do most is, is how can we really create good awareness raising? How can we have campaigns that can really make sure that the public starts to insist that the, that the concert is safe and the public also starts to protect their own ears and being aware about it? I've seen things changing, right? Because I live in the Flemish side of Belgium where, where uh, the, 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 the sound limits were already implemented a long time ago. In the beginning, you saw very interesting behavior. You saw music groups uh, being very noisy and saying, well, forget all the limitations, forget the minister. I play as hard as I like because it's our freedom. And now we see a huge change because the public is saying at that moment to the audience, who are you to damage my hearing? Uh, I want to enjoy your music, but I don't want to ruin my hearing. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a change coming. And you see in those countries where policies are being implemented and where they see these guidelines are being used, you see a, a shift of mentality. And hopefully the musicians can be convinced to, to really promote safe listening in a good way. And also removing all the myths. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings there. And that's what I think, I hope we can do, because that is the main challenge. To, to convince the users uh, and to, to convince the audiences is what is happening. Because I'm not too concerned about the sound engineers because a lot of them do fully understand what this is all about. And, and typically uh, the, the question is always who is calling the shots, right? Is it the sound engineer that will define what is happening at the concert? Is it the venue owner that will do that? Is it the music band that is doing that? Because I hear that there are a lot of tensions happening from time to time. So let's all join forces and make things safe and enjoyable. And I think that is something that will could make the difference if we do this right. Thank you. I think we're coming uh, to an end. Um, if anyone have some last minute questions, then I think um, please uh, put it in the chat. Otherwise I, I would suggest Shelly, maybe you have any, do you have some final advertisements to make before we close? Advertisements, yes. 
<laughs> no, I would like to say thank you to everyone in the panel today. It's been really interesting and I've personally le learned a lot as well, um, even though I'm an audio engineer, but I, I didn't learn these things in my education. So thanks a lot. I will do my best to um, share the Make Listening Safe um, activities and reports and all of this. We will, we will try our best to do that and spread it across the audio industry in Denmark. Um, and yeah, we have some other webinars. There's almost uh, one a week and next week it's perceptual audio evaluation. So if anyone would like to join for that, you're more than welcome. Um, and yeah, the recording and the presentations from today will be sent in an email afterwards, as well as a, a questionnaire. So it'd be great if you could fill that out. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you so much. And thanks to Dora for being our moderator today. Well, thank you uh, for uh, being allowed to do that. Uh, it's just interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it's appropriate, uh, but I could mention that uh, next year uh, we will host the Baltic Nordic Acoustical Meeting, which uh, in 2022 is raised to an Euro radio conference. So it's actually a conference for for all the European acoustic associations. Um, and we are, uh, you have to cross your fingers as well. Um, that we can actually attend a physical conference where we can go out and have a beer and we can talk. Uh, we can help introduce our young ones to, to seniors in the field and to make networks uh, grow. So, um, and more information is, is coming to, to the national societies, obviously. So. Which, month? Which month will that be? This will be on the, in, on, in May, uh, from the 9th to the 11th of May. Um, there's a call uh, open actually, or it isn't uh, announced yet, but we are open to suggestions for structured sessions and we could make a make listening uh, safe uh, structured session if, uh, if enough are interested and to follow up on, on the efforts and, and present some of the results uh, from practice if, uh, if any of you are interested. And this goes also to the audience. I don't know who's hiding in the audience list. I haven't had time to check, but for the Danish Sound Network and, and all of its uh, companies and uh, individual participants, it might also be relevant. I would also like to take the time to really thank all of you to make it possible to promote Make Listening Safe. We're so happy with this Make Listening Safe session. Danish Sound Cluster, all the people involved, Torte and the team, and also all the attendees. Uh, feel free to reach out for, uh, to us. I think we will really, we need, we need all of you to help us to promote it. It's a big challenge, but I'm sure that uh, the people on board here are the ones that are already converted and know about it. So looking forward for all, and thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you. You're so welcome. You have to take that one, uh, Shelley back to the Danish sound cluster and the working groups. Yes, I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's it for today then. So hope to see you guys soon for another event and have a nice evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.